Hello, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present my work here. Actually, also thank you to uh, Vladimir Korova for already introducing the uh, hyperfine structure, the spin-spin and spin um, correlation in HD+, because my work is very similar, only that I would like to now go to the experimental side of things. So yeah, I will talk, I will be talking about the ongoing measurement campaign at our experiment Alpha Trap at the MPI for nuclear physics in Heidelberg in Germany. And uh, yeah, so it's the, you're measuring the hyperfine structure of a single HD plus ion in a penning trap. Okay, so um, I would like to start on why molecular hydrogen ions are interesting. And um, first, I would like to say that there are already like in the past years, there's been very interesting publications on very high precision vibrational and rotational spectroscopy on HD plus. And the, the vibrational and rotational transitions that we have in molecules give access to fundamental constants. And in the case of these publications, they measured mass ratios of the constituent particles to very high precision. Now, if we continue on to H2+, which is a homonuclear diatomic molecule, so there are no electric dipole transitions allowed, which gives us very, natural, very narrow natural line widths in the row vibrational energy levels. So if we consider measuring H2 plus levels very, very precisely, and consider that H2 plus is made out of two protons and an electron only, we can in the, far, in the further future think about creating an antiparticle, so two antiprotons and a positron, and performing high precision CPT and matter antimatter symmetry tests on these systems. So, um, so why, why would this work very well is because uh, the vibrational transitions are very sensitive to the electron to proton mass ratio and the difference to the antimatter particles. And the sensitivity here is about three orders of magnitude larger than in similar measurements on atomic hydrogen. So um, for more information, you can look at this publication here that describes the whole motivation on why to measure H2 plus and H2R2 minus in penning traps. But uh, looking back at these measurements here, they are very, very nice, but they use Paul traps and whole clouds of ions and measure destructively. So if we in the future want to measure antimatter, we definitely need a technique to uh, measure on a single ion and non-destructively. Fortunately, this is something we can do in penning traps. So we can measure single ions in a non-destructive way. And this is why we have started measuring on hydrogen molecular ions for this future application. Okay, so um, the, uh, the non-destructive state detection would work in a way that the uh, hyperfine structure split, the level splitting the hyperfine st structure changes if you go to an excited row vibrational level, which means that we want to, well, we want to measure the vibrational transition very precisely, but we also want to look at the hyperfine structure because that would serve as the non-destructive state detection. Which brings me to the next point, why are we starting on the hyperfine structure of HD plus? So HD plus is not homonuclear anymore. We have a proton and a neutron which means that uh, the lifetimes of the excited or vibrational states are a lot shorter. So the, the longest one is about 140 seconds, which means that from ion production until we have a single ion in a trap, we can be very sure that the ion is in the ground state and start working in the ground state, which makes life for the first tests easier. Um, and then we can show on this ion, system, on this ion that we can do a non-destructive state detection. So we can detect the ion and detect exactly in which hyperfine level of the ion is in our trap. So, and then furthermore, like what uh, Vladimir Korobov also said, they are, there's for example, this measurement here that did vibrational, uh, vibrational spectroscopy on HD plus and extracted the proton to electron mass ratio here. And we can see that the largest uncertainty in this value is due to spin-spin interaction theory. So um, that is another motivation to go to HD plus and actually measure the hyperfine structure directly. And uh, another thing that he also mentioned in his talk <laughs> is that there, um, there's another vibrational transition measured and uh, they uh, derived uh, the spin-spin uh, interaction value from their measurement and had a four, roughly four sigma deviation to a theoretical value. So uh, in conclusion, it is very interesting and also highly relevant because they get very fundamental mass values from these transitions to measure the hyperfine transitions directly. Get more information. Okay, so uh, what does the hyperfine structure look like? We've already seen some of it in the previous talk, but since we're in the ground state, in the row of virtual ground state here, we for now do not have to worry about 
all the uh, coefficients in the Hamiltonian, but also only about the ones that do not include rotation of the molecule. So what we have is the three particles. You have the deuteron, the proton, and the electron, and they have spin one half, one half, and the deuteron is spin one. So if we look at the level structure and at the Hamiltonian in only, again, only in the row operational ground state and without magnetic field, we only have two components. We have one coupling the proton and the electron spin, which the E4 coefficient gives the strength, and another one that couples the deuteron and the electron spin, and which is described by E5. There is also a third one, which is second order in ID and linear in IP and SE. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it was not on Vladimir. It was slide. not on Vladimir. <laughs> several times I pointed him, but he was resistant. So okay. now I'm <laughs> claiming okay. that there is also um, a, a, the one which, but Vladimir mentioned one thing which you didn't mention that his result was only for the leading uh, relativistic contribution from the, uh, from the, Yes, for the alpha four, and you, are, you have written that it's for arbitrary. So it's for the leading term in the alpha, in the, for the leading relativistic contribution, because the correction which I, which I said is, for example, for the quadrupole moment. Okay. Because the term has a quadrupole moment, yes. it may couple to both spins. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But yeah, so we get, um, <laughs> for now, let's consider these two terms. So we get four energy levels, but we're working in a penning trap. So, and as my colleague earlier has introduced, our penning trap at alpha trap has a four Tesla magnetic field, which means that we will get very strong Zeeman splitting. So now the energy shift of a level will not only depend on these two Hamiltonian coefficients, but also on um, the uh, magnetic moments of, the, of each of these three single particles. So in term of a level scheme, this gives us 12 energy levels of the hyperfine structure. And uh, we now want to measure transitions in, the, in, this, in this level scheme. So I put some frequency values here, just as like an order of magnitude reference for you. Uh, there's a proton spins marked in red, a deuteron spins in green, spin flip transitions, and electron spin flip transitions marked in blue. And as you can see, proton and deuteron have lower spin flip transition energies that are like tens to hundreds of megahertz. And the electron spin flip transitions in our four Tesla field are on the order of 112 to 113 gigahertz. For now in our experiment, these electron transition frequencies are the only ones we can probe. And uh, so yeah, what we decided to start on is to measure the pure electron spin flip transitions because we have access to them in our setup. Okay, so uh, let's go to our setup. And if you play, paid close attention to my colleague's talk, we'll know all, all the things I, I am going to say now. Uh, but nevertheless, I will repeat some of them that are essential to or import, most important to uh, the measurements we are doing here on HD+. So we have a penning trap set up, which means we have a four Tesla field, a strong superconducting magnet generating the four Tesla field. And we can apply voltages to these ring electrodes shown here that are stacked up and can also then create an electric field. So we have three-dimensional confinement of an ion with static fields. Um, Okay, so a couple of facts to our setup. It's cryogenic, so we're at we're cooled by liquid helium, so at about 4K. Our ions are produced externally at, in a room temperature beamline and are then injected to the trap. And we can then have a valve to close off the cryogenic section. So we only deal then with the trap setup. It's, the closing off of the cryogenic section also leads to very, very low pressures of like roughly 10 to minus 16 millibar. And that leads to uh, us being able to store our ions for several months. So we can load them and we close off and we have our ions for several months and perform measurements on only one. And this one ion will be orbiting in our trap for months. Um, and we have a technique to, um, we have a technique to um, detect the image current that one single ion uh, induces into these trap electrodes so we can read out the signal. And then our setup mainly consists of tr two traps. Uh, it's the precision trap and the analysis trap. Our precision, precision trap is designed in a way so we have very homogeneous fields uh, versus the analysis trap, which has a very strong magnetic bottle. So uh, to understand this, you can think about the magnetic field in a Taylor expansion in the, the uh, precision around the ion position in the precision trap here. You will only basically only get the first term, so the four Tesla B0, and almost no, de no uh, dependence on the, um, the distance. So only the first coefficient versus in the analysis trap, you'll get about the four Tesla, 
and then a very high x squared term in the expansion. So there's a oh, strong dependence on where you are in the trap. And we will use this because this will allow us to map the orientation of the electron spin, whether it points up along the magnetic field or down along the magnetic field. And due to this model, we can map that on the uh, axial frequency the ion has in the trap. So it's a way to read out the spin orientation, whether the electron spin goes up or down. Um, and then we have microwave and laser access uh, from up from the bottom upwards into the trap. Okay, so what do we do on a measurement? We have our ion here, our HD plus, sitting in our precision trap. And uh, what we do now is we want to perform the spectroscopy here because our fields are nice and homogeneous. Uh, so what we do is we read out these three eigenfrequencies that the ion has in our trap. We have these three frequencies, two radial motions and one axial oscillation. We, we measure them, all three of them. We add them quadratically to get the free cyclotron frequency as a measure of the magnetic field. To cancel out magnetic field fluctuations, we now we want to measure this value at the same time as we irradiate the microwaves to probe our resonance. So what we do is we irradiate microwaves and simultaneously measure this free cyclotron frequency, which we usually call gamma, just the ratio of these two frequencies. Now, like I said, we have a very nice homogeneous field. So unfortunately, we cannot read out whether we have actually clipped the electron spin, so whether we have irradiated the right frequency. So after doing that, we transport the ion into the other trap. And then here, due to a change in the axial frequency, because here we have this V2 term in, in our magnetic field, we can read out whether the electron spin still points along the axis it was upwards when it was there first, or whether we have caused the spin orientation to flip due to the microwave irradiation. So what we see here actually is already non-destructive state determination because we had the ion centered on the axial frequency of the ion centered on our detector. We irradiate the microwaves and we, we can see here that the um, the axial frequency of the ion has shifted by a roughly 13 hertz, which is like the specific electron spin jump uh, of HD plus in our trap. So um, if we now consider the other hyperfine levels or even low vibrational excited levels, there will be a, a single specific microwave frequency to drive this electron spin flip dependent on the low vibrational and the hyperfine state. So by observing this flip, we know exactly which hyperfine and later on also go operational level the ion is in. Okay, so uh, what, what is the status? Where are we at? So this is back, back to our level diagram. In uh, these 12 levels of the hyperfine structure, there are six possible pure electron spin flips that we can probe. And uh, they're all like, you know, these are the frequencies we're dealing with, 212, 213 megahertz. And um, if we look at what the, uh, the transition energy roughly so yeah, it depends on um, the electron G factor, the bound electron G factor, and E4 and E5, which were um, the uh, strengths in the Hamiltonian coefficient, the strengths in the Hamiltonian terms. So uh, due to the proton and electron spin coupling and the proton and neutron spin coupling. So it, in approximation, the energy is a linear combination of these, these three terms, which means you want to measure at least three of these transitions to extract the bound G factor of the electron and these two Hamiltonian coefficients of the spin-spin interaction theory. Okay, um, we have been measuring for a bit now, and where we're at right now is that the two arrows that are now marked in red are trans transitions that we have measured. So we see that one transition here has more than 300 data points, and the other one that we are currently measuring on last night was at 207 data points. So this is exactly where we're at right now. And uh, this, uh, this resonance here, so again, the gamma is the ratio of the irradiated micro microwave frequency divided by the cyclotron frequency, which is a measure of our B field. So it's irradiated frequency divided by the magnetic field that we're at at that point in time. And, um, and versus the spin flip probability. So. Yes, this curve here yeah, shows the, spin, the first the uh, transition that has more data points. And uh, so what can we already say about the, uh, the transitions that we have measured? So um, if we look at the theory value for the bound G factor of the electron in HD plus, um, we, we can compare to this theory value from Hegstrom from 1979. And we're still evaluating our data. It's definitely not final yet the evaluation, but preliminarily we can say that we can see an agreement with, with this theory value 
at the uncertainty of the theory value, which is roughly one tenth to the minus seven. So that looks good. <laughs> but uh, if we go further, like once we finished evaluation and considered all our systematics, we can get to a precision of roughly two tenths to the minus ten. So that would, in in terms of frequency, that are about one hundred twelve gigahertz, we can get to like several ten hertz absolute uncertainty on these transition frequencies, and therefore also on the bound G factor and the uh, terms of the spin-spin interaction to 35. Okay, so let's look at the theory terms that we have, the best current values of E4 and E5. So that's this publication here from 2020. And we can see E4 and E5, these are their values and their absolute uncertainties are 900, about 900 and about 80 Hertz. But considering that we aim, or we rather sure that we can get to several 10 Hertz absolute uncertainty, we can perform a very nice and good test of, um, of the spin-spin interaction theory on these two coefficients and even like be far below the theory uncertainty of, for one of these values. Okay, so uh, what's next? What are our plans after we have successfully measured enough of these transitions to perform a good theory test? Are to implement a drive to also be able to address the proton and the neutron spin flips. So as just for you to, <laughs> as a reminder, so in this level diagram, there are these lower energy transitions that the one we cannot address, but yeah, we have plans to upgrade our setup to be able to address these two. And uh, we are building up a laser system also for vibrational spectroscopy on molecular hydrogen ions with Professor Stefan Schiller from Düsseldorf. And so yes, then the uh, very core feature goal is to perform single ion non-destructive vibrational spectroscopy on H2+. And uh, so yeah, we aim for 10 to minus 15 in the future. Not, not the first thing we'll do, but that's like our future aim. And uh, to get to that precision, we will have to cool our ion down further. So at the moment we're at 4K. But to get to that such high precisions, we need to suppress Doppler effects. So there is also efforts to do sympathetic laser cooling in penning traps. So that means we'd load uh, beryllium plus ions and cool them with the laser and then have them sympathetically cool our ion of interest. There also have been two publications recently, one from our group, one from a group from the G-Factor group in Mainz, closely, we have worked together closely too. So there's been first steps along that path. And uh, I would also like to say that um, we are open for other measurements along the way. So there are a lot of experts on HD plus or hydrogen molecular ions here. So um, it's, it's a far step to this very high precision vibration spectroscopy. So we, yeah, feel free to contact us for which steps along the way would be of most interest to better understand the hydrogen molecular ions. Like for example, more hyperfine measurements or vibrational spectroscopy on HD plus. Okay, with that, we'd like to thank you for your attention. And also thank my group and thank Stefan Schiller and his group. Thank you very much. So at this impressive 10 to minus 10 precision level, we are sensitive to the proton magnetic moment, which we can measure the proton simply. And if I will, you will you will be able to measure determine the deuteron magnetic moment. Well, yeah, I mean for now we can't address them, but yes. So let me also come up that there is this additional hyperfine term, which was missing the relevant problem. There is also additional term for the magnetic moment for the interaction with B. So it is, so at the 10 to minus 10, you may consider complete interaction. So, yeah, I mean, that's another reason why we want to measure more than three. So if you measured all six, there'd be more room for a higher order terms. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> because it's high order, you have more yeah. complicated term. And also because we're in a very strong magnetic field. And like all the other measurements in Paul traps have low magnetic field, so yeah, more than three. Very good. <laughs> Questions, comments. Yes, uh, very good. Ah, then, yes. Is there also someone there? Chikos? Okay, this works. <laughs> and uh, if I understand it correctly, to prepare the ground state, uh, you will need beryllium, right, to sympathetically cool uh, your uh, your ions. Is that um, correct? Well, for H two plus, it, mm, not not the raw vibrational ground state. No, mm -hmm. that is more for uh, to cool the emotional modes of the ions. Okay. So in our trap, there's also 
the emotional amplitude is like for Kelvin, like thermally kind of large. So if you want to go to very high precision, you'll need to decrease that. And, and how do you cool it? Uh, At the moment? The, no, or uh, the H2 plus the future, potentially? Yes, in the future. Yeah. Um, so, well, we haven't really, we ha we're, we're not working <laughs> on H2 plus <laughs> yet, but so yeah. there's there's techniques to uh, produce it in a low row vibrational or even ground state row vibrational level. But also we could, um, we could also just uh, for H2 plus load a cloud and then uh, dissociate all the higher levels and then be left with low level. Or we can, um, if we determine the state that we're in, which we can do in our IT by determining the microwave transition for the electrons we flip, we can say which row vibrational state we're in. And then we can use laser excitation to bring it to the ground state. Mm -hmm. but just plus one question. Yes. Uh, is this, uh, then what is the advantage compared to the people doing linear traps, like having single ions? Uh, um, well, what will be the advantage of your method? The, the main, so the most obvious advantage is that if you want to go to antimatter at some point, ah. you won't get a cloud of antimatter and not, especially, especially not several clouds to measure destructively. Sure, no, but I meant the single ions. You can go and put beryllium, one ion, and uh, ah, for, in, a, in, a, in a linear trap. Ah, that is true. Um, I know people are ah, doing okay, this at uh, ETH. Yes, yes, I, see I, what, I see what yeah. you're saying. Um, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I guess maybe it's also an alternative approach and, or also a test in uh, high magnetic field and low magnetic field. Maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. there's more reasons. <laughs> Thank you. Short comment. Uh, just a short comment. Uh, for HD plus, in principle, you don't need to do any cooling, especially because like the, the excited vibrational levels, they will decay because there is a, there is a dipole amount uh, for H2 plus. Okay, so I misunderstood. It's a practical question, very practical uh, to you or maybe some other penning trap expert. Is there an advantage to be at such a high field, magnetic field, or could you, what are the gains and losses if you go to a low field? Uh, maybe you can't go in your system and maybe microwaves don't propagate down. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's just. Okay, so for one, it's a superconducting magnet. We can't really change the current without. But if, if you were to design an experiment from the beginning, um, mm. is, is there an optimal, optimal field? <laughs> well, I guess like just for trapping, it, as long as you're at a couple of Tesla, you, you can trap, but... Um, Uh, I mean, I mean, the, the point of high magnetic field is to get the spin flip visible in non destructive way. So, uh, in principle, you would like to actually, if, if you want to see the proton spin flip, like, like what we are doing in base, you have to go to even higher. Amplitude. So, but you effectively, you would be rather, it would be rather not possible to decrease the, the, the basic value as well, because you, you need very high gradient. Yes, thank you very much for your nice talk. Um, about the, uh, the quantum state distribution, yeah? um, you are in the n equals zero at low temperatures, so that's not a problem, but can you then produce your molecules at will in two states, or do you have to wait till you get one and... Uh, you and mean you, the hyperfine it, state? Another one or... The hyperfine state? Yeah, while the MJ is also... You mean the, which of the 12 hyperfine levels? Yeah, yeah, exactly. um, yeah so uh, no, they are produced randomly and yeah. we extract one ion and we basically like we see which state we're in and then can measure there. And we thought that that state would be very stable and would not change. We actually have observed changes of the neutron and proton spin orientations, which uh, are probably due to black body radiation entering oh, our yeah. trap. We're not. Yeah, yeah. Entirely sure on that, but yeah, so it does change, which was kind of unexpected for us. But in principle, like in a four in four K, it, it shouldn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. oh, yes. um, so my question is about the um, when when you measure the spin flips. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I quite get um, when when you go from the uh, uh, the trap. And then 
Okay, can we go to the picture? It would be yes. much easier. Yes, That's here. <laughs> so when you go to the uh, the smaller trap down, mm -hmm. won't you lose the quantization axis for the magnetic field here when you go to the other other trap and then so your soft levels are not well defined anymore? Or what? Um, well, it's all in the same magnet. So it's just a uh, like ring electrodes that are stacked, but it's all in the same four Tesla magnetic field. So the the four Tesla is throughout the, it's a big magnet and this is like a trap, small ring electrodes that are inserted in one, in one piece into thought, the magnet. So in that area, it's not. No, it's still, it's still in the same four Tesla region. So we it has a, additional, the additional X squared B2 term. We have a question from the online attender. Okay. Sorry, my pronunciation of his name will be not right. So, but I'm sorry. Shank Poor, huh? How to introduce how to produce a single HD plus ion in a trap. Ah, <laughs> okay. Uh, so we load a whole cloud of ions and then it's basically like uh, setting the voltages on the rings. So um, we can put them all in, in, in uh, on one of the ring electrodes and set the other, the, the neighboring electrodes to like uh, slightly different values and then ramp the center electrode up and then we basically split the cloud and we can also excite the ions. So if we have like, let's say three ions, we can excite them and then uh, detune. The uh, no, sorry, emotionally excite them. So they are just like, they get hotter basically. So they are on higher emotional amplitudes and we can, if they're on higher emotional amplitudes at some point they will see inhomogeneous field, electric fields in which we will shift their frequencies. And then we can excite, like purposely excite just some of them except for one and get them hotter and hotter until they are lost in the trap. In other words, we have to work for that. Yes. <laughs> for the questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, in fact, it's just a comment about the previous question about uh, state preparation for H2 plus the mm -hmm. initial state preparation. Um, in addition to what you mentioned, uh, there is one more way to do to do it, uh, which is to, I don't know if it's feasible in your system, actually. Um, the idea is to put the ion in a large radius cyclotron orbit, and then uh, this ion moving in this magnetic field will experience a motional electric field, which will make uh, one photon decay mm -hmm. allowed. And then you can accelerate the decay towards a lower, lower line states. So I don't know if it's possible in your case. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have heard about that. Um, I'm not sure it's possible. It kind of depends on the strength of the magnetic field. So I'm not sure if four Tesla is enough. Yes, it I might know. be. I, I will have to look into that in the future. <laughs> if I, as well, a question like to the potential measurement of H2 plus. Could you determine the initial state by by a mass measurement? Um, so there has been a mass measurement in Florida on H two plus, and they could determine the different vibrational modes as mass differences. But the rotational modes, the rotational excitations, were too close together. But that is like a, an experiment very specialized in mass measurements. So I'm not sure we could do that with our trap that is specialized in transitions and g factor measurements. But in principle, it's possible. I'm not sure we could. <laughs> Thanks.